This is Masters in Business with Barry Ritholtz on Bloomberg Radio. This week on the podcast, Ed Hyman returns to talk about all things economic analysis, what's going on in the world, how he's built an incredible career. Oh my God, 43 times number one ranked in the Institutional Investor Survey in economics. That's just unprecedented, and I'll keep saying no one will ever beat that 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 uh, streak. Um, Ed is a fascinating guy. He's built a fascinating company. He is one of those people who focuses on figuring out what's happening here and now and is less concerned about making forecasts about the future. Um, his clients adore him. He helps keep them on the right side of the trade. And he's really um, just one of these legends and gems on, on Wall Street. Uh, I could keep going, but let me just stop and say, with no further ado, my conversation with ISI Evercore's Ed Hyman. Very great to see you. Great to see you. You know, the last time you were here, that number was something like 35 times, <laughs> All right. which was also unbeatable. That That is a um, record that I don't believe will, will ever be topped. Before we get into the details of your career and, and your work, how on earth is anyone ranked number one for 43 consecutive times? That, that's amazing. So I don't know. I, I've been really lucky in my career, mm-hmm. and I, I listen to your show all the time, and most well, people will say that, I've right. been lucky. And frankly, if they've done a lot, they have to have been lucky. My greatest talent is work. I'm really a hard worker. Mm-hmm. I know how to work. I like working. And so that's... Maybe number one. Wouldn't, and, wouldn't you say that in in finance, which is such a competitive field, hard work and intelligence, that's just table stakes to, to get into the game, isn't it? It is, but it's table stakes in every game. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't change much. And there are people I know that work harder than I do. Mm-hmm. And they do better. <laughs> well, not better than 43 in a row. <laughs> well, uh, I, 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 like, um, I like Peter Lynch's description of what made you successful. I think it was in his book, One Up on Wall Street. Ed Hyman is much more practical than most economists. He's more interested in examining railroad cars than Laffer curves. What does <laughs> that say about what makes you special and different from other economists? Yeah. First, I, I like working. Mm-hmm. And I've worked to the point that I've found something I really enjoy doing. You know, that's a, maybe the second most important thing for anybody, for you right. or me. Uh, I have a real interest in helping people, which, you know, some people have that interest and some people don't. But I do. And so I met Peter Lynch, how was that, 50 years ago or 40 years ago? <laughs> I said, I got to help this guy. And he said, no, thanks. I said, wait a minute, I'll come back. And so I tried to find something that I could do that would be of interest to basically an equity investor. Mm-hmm. And he's you know maybe the best that's been around. And so he set me off in a direction that was practical. And at that point, commission business that he generated was ginormous. I'm sure. <laughs> and so I was incentivized you know, monetarily to help him. I wouldn't put him as a mentor because I didn't spend that much time with him. But he definitely influenced my career in a practical way that I think has served me very well ever since then. Because I'm always trying to find things that are practical. And I happen to like Art Laffer. You mentioned the Laffer curve, Mm -hmm. which I think is frankly pretty much a stroke of genius. But, you know, it's it's not uh, something that people make money off of every day. Right. So I'm trying to mix both things that are intellectual and theoretical as, as well as things that they have a practical side to them. So so let's talk a little bit about the genesis of that practical side. You, you get your BS in engineering from University Think of, of Texas, that. <laughs> right? So engineers tend to be pragmatic problem solvers. And then you get an MBA from MIT. So you have all of this very pragmatic experience as opposed to getting a PhD in economics, which tends to be a little more abstract and academic. How much of of your rankings come from the fact that you have these very problem-solving oriented academic background? How, how did that affect you? A lot. You know, if you're hardworking and you're trying to do things 
that people value. And my client base, if you will, are institutional investors. I went all the time. <laughs> mm-hmm. So so let's talk a little bit about the early days of your career when you come out of school. 1969 to 71, you're an economic consultant at Data Resources. What what did you do for those guys? That that sounds kind of interesting. <laughs> Whenever Otto actually I wanted some coffee, I brought it to him. <laughs> so you started as a very junior uh, person on the totem yeah, pretty, pole. Pretty pretty junior, but I had, at that point uh, I had a pretty special knowledge of econometrics. Mm-hmm. At MIT, they had the first time sharing. Big mainframe. Big mainframe, but you could share the data, share the computer programs. And the first real practical application was the SAGE American Airlines ticket system, mm-hmm. which is a you know, time sharing where you get your tickets and that's all. That also. eventually became Sabre, right? Sabre, it- sorry. And so I had done that at MIT, mm-hmm. and Otto Eckstein, who was a professor in the economics department at Harvard, he started a company that did that exact thing. They're right down the street from MIT, right? <laughs> right there. And I was working for a professor named Ed Koo, who was a friend of Otto Eckstein, and so they were talking, and I got the job. So that was a stroke of good luck. Plus, I, I was in the right spot at the right time. Right. What was the data like back then? I, I'm thinking of punch cards and very rudimentary well, computing. Well, it was before then. Mm-hmm. And actually, I did a lot of punch cards. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're too young for this. I, <laughs> when I started college, punch cards and timeshares were still a thing. Yeah. But it was a fading thing, and the newfangled technology was coming. You, you right. saw it on the horizon. I just jumped right over that card deck into data resources where the data was in a computer you shared. Mm-hmm. And so you didn't have to carry the deck around. And it, it was it was a major step forward. Pretty much the same technology as today. We still use the data resources system constantly. And the data is there. The only thing that's changed is there's much more data. More data, faster, bigger. It just has obviously scaled up a lot since back right. then. So it's not just government data. Now there's a lot of industry data. Which you guys will talk a little bit about what ISI does in assembling its own data. Let's just continue along your career. 72, you end up at C.J. Lawrence. Tell us what you did there. What was that work like? Yeah. So at, at Data Resources, mm-hmm. I worked with our clients. And uh, Otto Eckstein, who is a spectacular human being, uh, he passed away, I think, in his 50s. You know, he went from the cover of Time magazine to not being with us anymore. Mm-hmm. But he was a phenomenal person, and he had this game plan. He would hire people out of school that seemed to be over on the ball, right. on the ball. <laughs> right. And they would work for data resources and take care of clients, and then a client would hire them. And he said, that's great. <laughs> and he was, he just Because they're locked in as a client. They're locked in point. as a client. Right. So I remember telling him, I think I called him Otto. I shouldn't have, but I, I did. I said, Otto, I said, I have a job offer uh, to go to work for one of our clients, C.J. Lawrence. And he said, oh, Ed, that's great. <laughs> I kept waiting for the counter. <laughs> and so I, I remember... Uh, Barry, he took me to lunch at Friendly's. <laughs> right. For a fribble and some uh, fries. I don't right. remember the Friendly's. Uh, but anyway, so that was how I got to C.J. Lawrence. Didn't uh, they end up getting purchased by, uh, was it Deutsche Bank? By some? Deutsche Bank. Right. How did that affect your plans uh, going forward? Did you want to go to a big bank, or is that what led to the next step in your career? That was the, ne- the next step. And that was ISI. ISI. So that's ninety one. So you were you were CJ Lawrence for a good good while for almost twenty years. years. Wow. All right. So you found ISI Group with some partners. Uh, tell us a little bit about the plan for launching an independent economics research shop. Yeah. So at that point, I had a pretty big career. Uh, I'd been ranked II back in the seventies. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you can do the math and. I had a I basically to had be a, fair. In the beginning, you were only like runner up and second. You right. really, you really weren't carrying <laughs> your share of the right. lo- workload. No, you, I, you were coming in second place. I mean, that's just no go. <laughs> you have to start somewhere. <laughs> right. Start at number two and work right. your way up. And it was easy transition to mm-hmm. start my own shop. And I had a group of people, and uh, Jim Moltz ran 
C.J. Lawrence, and he was and still is like a father to me. So he was very helpful. We all could tell that it probably wasn't uh, the best fit for somebody who liked working for small companies to work for you know a big bank. I, I told I told him. He said, "Okay, Ed, would you stay until we find a replacement for you?" I said, "Of course." He came in one day. He said, "Ed, we I got some good news. We found a replacement for you. It's Ed Yardini." <laughs> And uh, I said, okay, that's great. I said, okay, if I send an announcement out. He said, it's okay, I've already sent one out. <laughs> Yardini was at Deutsche Bank for a long time until he launched uh, Yardini Research. Yeah, he's, he's very good. Really, he lives in the next town for me. We Is that right? We go out to dinner, yeah, he's yeah. A super nice guy. Super nice so, guy. Um, so let's talk a little bit about ISI was both a research shop, but you also set up ISA funds management mm-hmm. for uh, investors and clients. Two different groups, how, how did they coexist under the same roof? It was okay. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a great business. Frankly, it's not as, as strong as your business in the asset management business. Mm-hmm. I think I got up to, maybe I did get up to maybe $3 billion. Yeah, but your research side of the shop generated that was enough the, activity to make up for it. Yeah, that was, I forget what you, what you call it. Um, the side hustle. Your side, side hustle, hustle was managing institutional right. assets. Your real business is having the best perspective of what is happening this moment in the economy. And again, according to ISI, nobody does that better than you did. How long after you launched ISI did you get a sense that, hey, we really have this figured out. We have, we're providing research product that nobody else on the street seems to be doing. Actually, that had happened at C.J. Lawrence. Mm-hmm. You know, By the time I started ISI, I had already gotten a strong following and knew what I was doing in that space. And so I just made a transition. At that point, 1991 were recession years, and the stock market you know, had a pretty big drop. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, this is a bad idea to <laughs> start your own company. Turns out to be the perfect time to start your own company. It is a perfect time. But you, know, that's, right. you, you, you learn that a little later. <laughs> but it is a perfect time. At that point, I thought, well, if it doesn't work out, better than what I was doing. Right. So I had very low expectations. And then it turns out you know, the market, if you go from 91 forward, market just sort of went up and business was good. And it was good basically until maybe 2010. And since then, it's, it's been very difficult. Mm-hmm. So you've seen changes in the 70s and 80s, right? You had the bull market in the 90s, um, the financial crisis in the 2000s. Uh, the 2010 seemed totally uneventful other than the fact that you know there was no yield on the fixed income side. Yep. And here we are in 2020s, First the pandemic, now the increase in rates. In your long career in Wall Street, is there ever a decade where something isn't blowing up or going crazy? Isn't that just the normal state of affairs? I try to explain this to the younger guys in my office. Like, wow, this is crazy. It's like, no, no, something crazy is always going on. Doesn't crazy is always crazy. Right. Am I, <laughs> am I like not overstating that or? Well, I would I, say, you know, in a research response to you. So I've been through 13 Fed tightening cycles. Right. And everyone has had a financial shock or crisis. Continental Illinois, Mm -hmm. 84, for example. But every single one, New York Community Bank, it's just- Par for the course. Par, might even, not even quite par, but I mean, so I would be surprised if we don't have another one. It's it's part of the tightening cycle, I think. Huh, even if the Fed is arguably done tightening, you think there's Arguably, still but you more still, cockroaches coming out. Yeah. Huh, now, fascinating. Now, but I would also say, trying to put things into a historic perspective that we might enjoy a decade from now, the yield curve's still inverted, right? which is a tightening move. And every week, the Fed shrinks its balance sheet uh-huh. and it's doing about a trillion a year, which is not exactly- So you know, you're, saying the, you're saying the financial conditions are tighter presently than people seem to realize. Not just the financial conditions, because the market's up so much, and right. you know, credit spreads are very tight. But I'm saying the Fed tightening is probably ongoing, and bank deposits go down every week. Well, uh, if I get 5% in a money market, why am I gonna leave cash in a savings or a checking account? Right. So I, th- I think the Fed is still in a tightening mode, which is why I think, for example, New York Community Bank popped up. Mm-hmm. And if you are looking for it, which I am, every two or three days there's some story about a problem here or there. It could be a problem with the the German banks 
and commercial real estate, for example, has been a little backstory. Are, are you seeing this as a systemic issue or just isolated? I think it reflects the, the, the Fed tightening, mm -hmm. uh, and also ECB's been tightening. So it's all the same. But I, I do think that every period has problems, and like you mentioned, the smooth sailing in the 2010s. Didn't uh, feel that way at the time. I remember the Europe blowing up and Greece. <laughs> right, right. There was a lot of stuff that, seemed, that was happening. That seemed pretty bad. Right. You look at a stock chart, it's a little misleading. Yeah, oh, we right. started down here and we ended up here. Right. Must have been great. Yeah. Always climbing a wall of worry, right? Right. right. It, it seems like you're much less focused on the here and now than predictions. So, so let's talk a little bit about forecasts. How do you f use them or not? How do they fit into your research product? Well, you, you have to do forecast. Maybe forecasting is impossible. It's certainly difficult, but you have to do it because in order to make money, you have to have some sense about where things are going. And the difficult thing is to know when to hold it, know when to fold it. So that's like a mosaic you put together and you come up with a view that's based on whatever you would like. I, I always would like to have pretty strong theoretical or intellectual framework that I'm operating within and then see how things fit into that. And sometimes they continue to fit in and sometimes they don't. And there'll be plenty of times when they'll get bumps in the road. But I try and, and have a framework so I'm not just you know reporting the latest uh, data point, put it into a perspective. That's helped me because I, I most often have a view that when I talk to people, they can understand where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. Not only, only where I'm coming from, but why I have a particular viewpoint. I want to talk about the thing that first caught my eye with the work that you do, starting with your survey of people in the real economy, of businesses and sectors, rather than just rely on economic data that comes out of the government or earnings. Tell us about the surveys you created when you first started doing the sort of work you do. Early on, there was a business called Johnson Red Book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't write it down. <laughs> But they surveyed retailers. and That was like a weekly thing, right, if I remember yeah, weekly. correctly? Yeah, weekly. It sounded like a really good idea. I took that idea and took it to the limit. So now we survey about 30 industries, maybe 300 companies. In uh, each industry? Uh, 300 companies overall, 30 okay. industries. Like, re like retail, for example, or autos, trucking companies, you name it. We do wine and spirit wholesalers. Right. We, we have a, a survey we do at the end of the year of Christmas tree sales. Oh, really? We survey the people that grow them, people uh -huh. that truck them, and the people that sell them in the cities. So you're getting like a real-time snapshot of what's happening, not just across the economy, but within very specific subsectors. Yeah. I'm sort of a contrarian at heart. Is I don't trust government data. Right. It's also very difficult. How do you measure GDP two weeks or three weeks after the quarter ends or retail sales eight days after the month ends? Too much data to assemble, Ooh. right? If you think about it across the whole country, employment's the same way. How can you possibly Well, that's why they do three three of them, the early release, the update, and then the final. You get <laughs> right. cross th it takes them three months to do GDP. But even that's difficult. So then on the other side, you're a practical person. Mm -hmm. If you meet somebody, say, that uh, runs a business, and you say, how's business? They'll always tell you sure. with actually vivid detail, <laughs> real granularity, right? because they live it 24-7. So if you can you know, get a group of those, say a dozen, you have a pretty good leg up on what's happening in a particular sector. It's certainly different, and in some ways it's more reliable than trying to measure, say, retail sales, for example. So uh, what's their incentive to participate and to be uh, honest? I'm, I'm always fascinated by this. So if they participate with us, I send them our, our research. So they get it for free. And they that's get it a, for free. That's not an inexpensive product. So, so if, in their space, they, well, they get to see what their competitors are saying. They, not all of them bite. Right. <laughs> I'm saying. That's, that's one incentive. The second incentive is they get to see the result. Trucking survey we do comes to mind. I think we have a dozen truckers, and boy, there really aren't any more than that in the country. Right. There are only probably five big trucking companies, uh, but we get a dozen trucking companies. They all want to see what the other truckers are saying. Yeah, and so you can imagine if you're in a business that has some homogeneity to it, and uh, you see the survey, and it, it drops sharply, you say, we're doing great. 
Or if your business drops sharply and the, other, and the survey doesn't, you go, Uh-oh. hey, guys, <laughs> we're doing something wrong here. Sometimes you do things, and after a while, you conclude it's not the best idea. So you retire it if it's not working, and you move on to the next. That, but this just keeps working. Year after year. So let me tell, say week, the other week, thing. Week, week after week. Right. You know, anytime we talk about economic data, I love the George Box quote, all models are wrong, but some are useful. It's an incredibly insightful insight into statistics and modeling. You obviously picked that up 43 years ago because you said, I don't want anything to do with government data. Let's build our own models. Let's do a real-time assessment and try and keep it as close to objective reality because the more and more you model stuff out, the more it diverges from what's happening. So weekly, real-time, it's as close as you're going to get to the real thing. The other thing you did, though, that just really caught my eye is you would take a chart and it was either a survey result or a stock chart or a bond, whatever it was, and you would hand mark these up with a Sharpie and it just jumped off the page. And it was one of the first things that I'm like, wow, this is really fascinating. How on earth did that come about? (laughs) So I don't think I've invented a single thing in my life. I give you credit for inventing that because before you, I've never seen marked up charts that way. So let me me explain. So on the company surveys, there was just one group that did a survey of retailers, Mm -hmm. which turns out that was our first survey we did. It just worked out, but I really stole the idea from this other group. Uh, I was working in this business, I'm still in, at C.J. Lawrence, and the sales team which is an important part of the way you operate. You have to generate ideas for them and get them to believe in you. They were taking my work and and marking it up. Meaning literally? (laughs) They would mark it up. So I thought, boy, if they're marking it up, I can do a better job marking it up than they are. Uh And so I started doing that. And the, frankly, the the rest is history. The f- amazing thing is when you look, you can look at a million stock charts, but if you or whatever, yeah. but if you look at a chart and there's uh, in a sharpie and bold script, I goes to it. You can't help <laughs> but see it, and it 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 changes how you perceive that chart. It 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 shows you what's important. It shows you what to focus on, yeah. but it it just draws you right into it. Was, yeah. was that a purposeful strategy, or was this <clears throat> just something you were doing to? Show the guys in the office. No, no, you want to focus on this part. I would say the latter. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, if I'm if I'm working and it works for those guys, then it probably works for other people, like Peter Lynch. Right. So I think of you not as a pure economist, but as somebody who is both a business cycle expert and who has watched market cycles over the decades and has become an expert in market cycles. Is that a, a fair description to, to make? So if you do what I do well, you have to be market focused. You have to listen to the markets, you have to respect the markets, you have to learn from the markets. I look at the markets all the time on Bloomberg. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I mean, you, I'm, a, I'm a junkie. I probably look at you know, the markets three or four times an hour. Right. And just, as I'm sure you do, frankly, And you let it sink in. You say, does that fit with my picture I have in my head about what should be happening? How do you separate the intraday noise from the stuff that really matters? Because I started on a trading desk, so I was staring at a screen all day, and I have to force myself. You're looking at the market four times an hour. I'm forcing myself to look at the market less and less. I don't want to look at it constantly because it just makes me want to get in there and start trading. (laughs) Each of us finds their own voice. I know for me, being aware of what the markets are doing is part of my sauce. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm dealing with investors, obviously they're consumed by what's happening in the markets. Right. And so it's not a a foreign language to me at, at all. I think it helps me understand what I should be doing, part of a practical approach to what's happening. And I view myself as a business analyst. A business analyst. A business. So, so when I say business cycle, that, that's, that's right significant. On. Right and, on. Mm-hmm. And a business cycle, you know, part of the business cycle are the financial markets. So I remember early on in my career, I'd, I'd met a guy, and then they had an article about him in the Wall Street Journal. The market was doing something, and he said, it's just too much money in irresponsible hands. I thought to myself, this guy's a loser. <laughs> 
And how did his career work out? It, it, not well. <laughs> Too much money and irresponsible hands. Or the state of the world every day anyway. Isn't that how it is? Well, it's just, it, it, how useful is that as a market insight? Yeah, not, not useful. I want to share a quote from your client who put this up online. And someone asked him about Ed Hyman. And he responded, Ed Hyman sticks to his core mission of providing high quality and independent research. He helps portfolio managers make sense of the world. He sorts through the reams of economic data and government surveys to provide an objective and independent assessment. That's that's high praise from a client. Does that sound like the goals that you're aiming for? It sounds. Is that is that from my wife or? What? No, that was from a client who actually <laughs> no, kidding, answered yeah. a question about you. Yeah. So that that is high high praise, and and obviously that's what I want to do. I also part of my job is to connect the dots, to look at a hundred different observations and find the three that have an important message. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I get I get the right three, and some I don't. It's something that people can understand. And when it doesn't work out, then I move on to another perspective. Huh, really interesting. So <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the state of the economy today. And let's start with, where's our recession? In, in 22, I just kept hearing there's a recession coming. In 23, I, here comes a recession. What do you make of the economist's consensus that seems to have been pretty wrong for, I don't know, eight, 10 quarters in a row? Yeah, I'm a student of history. The last cycle, for example, it took 18 months from when the yield curve inverted to when the recession started in 2008. 18 months. During a good part of that, the S&P went up 20%. Right. And peaked eight weeks before the Great Recession hit. You don't know it's it's happened until it happens. As a student of history, you know it's not when the yield curve inverts. It's when it begins to uninvert that bad things start to happen. But that takes a long, a long time. And you can see, once you get that perspective, you can see real estate projects. They get started, and it takes probably 18 months for them to finish up. So that's just one example of why it takes so long. It takes a while for increase in interest rates to actually get into the system, because people first, they're living off the low interest rates. Right. It takes a while for people to get a 7% mortgage whereas now they have a 3% mortgage. But aside from that, the practical observation is it takes a long time. It takes so long that people give up on it. So Bernanke in 07 concluded we weren't going to have a recession. That was the subprime is contained <laughs> right. uh, phase. Is I remember contained. that. It was just contained, contained to planet Earth. Once you, uh, The rest of the solar system was fine. <laughs> but Boy, you mentioned Reinhardt and Rogoff. Sure. They, they wrote a piece in early 08, how silly it was that people had concluded it was different this time, uh, but that's what had, had happened. And so we're in that phase now, I think. The recession might not start for another six months. In life, there's a certain combination of being confident and being humble. You know, you, you have to be humble, but you have to have a certain amount of self-confidence that you know what's happening. So I, I think we're just going through the normal lags. At a dinner the other night and with clients, no one expected a recession. No one. That's a reversal from a year ago. <laughs> Everyone when, expected a right. recession. So, so I want to talk about inflation. But before I get to that, obviously, the Federal Reserve has a big impact on the economy. They raised, what are we, 525 basis points in 18 months? Uh, you got to go back to Paul Volcker to see a rate hike that radical and that quickly. If the higher for longer argument wins out and the Fed does not cut rates from here, and some people are now talking about raising rates from here, that sounds like that's a pretty surefire strategy for a recession. Is that a fair assessment? It's a fair. The, the economy is booming. It is booming. It's booming. But, I mean, but you're, yet you're saying end of this year we could see a recession. Right. It looks okay until it's not. It's the lag. <laughs> it's the lag. Latter part of 07, even though housing was imploding... Right. The economy was okay. And I mentioned the S&P had had a big rally and people were saying, well, it's different this time, et cetera. At the same time, I don't want to get too crazy about things. I don't want to make a fool of myself. And, right. And so I'm just saying it's coming. I'm confident or hopeful, let's say confident, that when it starts to hit, I won't be the last person to know. 
Right. I mean, I have a whole set of indicators that I think will help me know when a recession is starting to hit. It's not hitting now. I mean, the economy's booming. It's probably booming. It's a little strong. We do these company survey. 50 is uh, as expected. They got up to 60. Last week, they were 49. Mm-hmm. So 45 is recession territory. So they've cooled off quite a bit. So if we see, as some people are talking about, June or maybe even May, rate cuts, don't assume you're not going to get rate cuts in election year. There have been rate changes every presidential election going back uh, 40 years, just about. Um, if the Fed cuts rates in May, cuts rates in June, cuts rates in, in July or September, can we avoid a recession in 24 or 25? We might avoid it anyway. Mm-hmm. But uh, monetary policy works with long lags. The long and variable lag <laughs> is right. so hard to to get yes. away from. Right. And guess. Although you, you see it in real estate first, it seems. That, that seems to be where the rubber meets the road. Or, or do you uh, see other sectors get hit before that? You know, I'll, I'll look for, for, for wherever it is. Mm-hmm. But real estate, right now, the commercial real estate space, uh, there's a story probably every two or three days about mm-hmm. some problem here or there. So that problem hasn't gone away. Uh, it just takes a while uh, for it to work itself out. 98, uh, with a recession coming up a couple of years later. Mm-hmm. Oh, one. You had LTCM, right? which uh, long-term, what is it? <laughs> L- long-term capital, capital management. management. Um, and I, I'm not even sure I knew what it was. <laughs> at the time. <laughs> at the time, before it hit. I, 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 actually, I knew pretty well what it was. But you had no idea they were but, running 100 to 1 leverage. No. <laughs> Apparently they didn't either. <laughs> but uh, anyway, you know, that you know, darn near blew up the global financial system right. out of the blue. An, a, a, an early warning shot, right? Yeah. If and, only anyone had paid attention, maybe 08, 09 might not have happened. And, and then you had the Asia crisis in the same year, and mm-hmm. then you had uh, Russia. And, right. I mean, these are not things that you would have thought of first off if asked what could be a problem in right. 98, 99, what was, the, um, was the Thai bot crisis 97? And I then, think it was, yeah, maybe, maybe and 97. And I think Russia, which ultimately 98. ended up blowing up LTCM in 98 also, yeah. right? So you had two major events in two consecutive Great. years. Well, and, right. right. We and a- the market Asia, continued going higher. And, until the economy hit, hit a recession. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm just sort of pushing ahead. Economy's doing fine now. I don't think I'm adding a lot of value on this topic, but right. I'm just waiting to see you know, if we actually get into a recession. In the meantime, mm-hmm. inflation is coming down. So let's talk about inflation because I feel like lots of economists got that wrong also. And when you look at, I'm trying to figure out a, a, a polite way to say this. When you look at the um, well-known economists who came of age during the inflationary 1970s. I'm thinking of like Larry Summers, former uh, Treasury Secretary. They see inflation as structural. They see it very similar to the 1970s. And I get the sense that the transitory nature, and, and granted transitory took a little longer than people expected, but again, that long and variable lag. Uh, inflation peaked in June of 2022, it's come down. Uh, your pal Ed Yardini says historically, right. as fast as inflation goes up, it tends yep. to come down very symmetrically. You had a huge and rapid rise, and you've had a pretty rapid fall off from nine percent to three percent. Um, so one question is, why did so many people seem to get this wrong? You tell me, Barry. I don't know. I mean, I'm playing pop psychologist and say, well, if you were a '70s era economist, well, you're just going back to your roots and not yeah. looking at at the supply side shock and, and supply chains and all these pandemic-related issues that unwound more organically than I think people expected. So, so in the 70s, I'm at MIT, mm-hmm. and they have a, a debate posted on the bulletin board between Milton Friedman and uh, Paul Samuelson. Right. Not sure who they are, but I'll go. <laughs> and there are probably 20 kids in the room. That's I, unbelievable. I was kids. blown away. Right. Because they both were incredible intellects. Samuelson eventually wins a Nobel Prize, right? Freeman doesn't do badly either. <laughs> Another but, giant. Absolutely. A giant. Anyway, so I, bec- I really got into his logic. And he became, in the 70s, a very major 
figure. 100%. Inflation is and always will be a monetary phenomena. Right. And then he had you know extreme views on capitalism, which are not popular now. At this point, he's not woke. Sort of Larry Summers of the world, who I think is is brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, they've sort of pushed away from that, but I haven't. Right. And well, I bet you've pushed away on some of the stuff. I was always surprised at um, sort of the free market absolute stuff, like. We don't need an FDA if if baby formula kills a baby. Well, then, well then they'll change the formula or they'll go out of business. I mean, I, I think that was that's a little extreme. I, I understand what he was saying intellectually, right? Uh, but I think the way it came across just did not resonate with uh, right. even with a lot of economists. But no doubt, one of the most influential e economists of the past century, right? And so, in in the seventies, the money supply would accelerate, mm -hmm. maybe ten or fifteen percent. And then inflation would accelerate. And it happened three times. And by the third time, Freeman was a major figure on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. When the money supply numbers would come out on Thursday afternoon, trading floors, which I was on a trading floor waiting for the numbers, they would erupt. It was wow. you know, up 30 billion, oh, only up 2 billion or whatever. I mean, it was, it was something else. And so I bought that and so in the, in the eight in the seventies, uh, inflation you could see it coming and see it going away. Right, and right. and and this time, money growth got up to thirty percent, and inflation took off, and now money growth is slightly negative. I'm in the case that inflation's going away, plus you know take everything into account, like you mentioned the supply chain issues, mm -hmm. uh, transitory. Those things are there. Demand destruction is there because prices go up so much, and you don't want to buy it if it goes up anymore, etc. Uh, Commodity traders love to say the cure for high prices is high, high prices, prices right. right? I mean, yeah. I heard that my whole uh, well. my whole career. So, so let's talk a little bit about you as a as watching money supply. I again, I tell the young guys in my office, you know, back in the day, the Fed didn't announce a change in rate policy. They certainly didn't hold uh, a press conference. You found out about changes in interest rates when the bond market told you interest rates are now this. <laughs> right. Tell us about that era. It, it, I'm assuming that's in part why you're watching things like money supply. Well, I've always watched the money supply, and the Fed can operate uh, through interest rates uh, or through the money supply or through jawboning the markets, which mm -hmm. they, they do now. You can see them saying we're not going to cut rates, so they are going to cut rates. So that's been a familiar territory for me for 50 years. Really? At, in the early part, Volcker said he liked to keep his cards close to his vest, and he had a big vest. So, tall Paul, <laughs> tall Paul, and so that was that. And in the the, the German central bank, they said, "I'm going to better that. I'm going to give the market a fake out. I'm going to indicate I'm not going to do this, and then I'll do it because you get more bang for your buck if uh -huh. you really surprise the markets." But now we're in a situation where the Fed is totally transparent, and we have what a dozen people a week right. uh, commenting uh, on what they're doing. Speeches, transcripts, Q&As. I mean, it's such a different world than the 1970s or 80s. Does that make it easier to track what they're doing, it's, or is it harder because now everybody sees the same story yeah, at once? It doesn't strike me as any particularly any harder. Or The question is, what's the impact? Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, you mentioned the, in, the big increase in interest rates. Uh, 525 basis points, you correctly point out. In addition to that, the Fed has shrunk the balance sheet a trillion dollars. They went from quantitative easing to quantitative tightening. tightening. Meaning they're, they're no longer buying bonds, they're now selling bonds. Big time. And so a, a general rule of thumb uh, that Bernanke's talked about, uh, Bill Dudley the, was the chairman of the New York Fed, mm -hmm. uh, is that a trillion dollars is in the neighborhood of 100 basis points on the fund rate. In other words, buying or selling a, a trillion dollars worth of bonds is the equivalent of 100, 100 basis four, points. A, a percentage higher or a percentage lower in rates. Right. So I think the fund rate is about 6.5%. Really? Because it's 5.5, and they've shrunk the balance sheet by a trillion. So historically, 6.5% is pretty average if you go back 50 years. But if you go back to 2000, 6.5% sounds high. really high. Right. And there's some rates like uh, consumer credit card rates mm -hmm. are up to 21% or 22. Which seems a, a bit stiff. 
<laughs> it's prohibitive. And I think used car rates are 15 or 16. I mean, there are some rates, mortgage, mortgage rates are up to 7%. Uh, so there are some rates that are high. Uh, but then there's also the mystical about the money supply. You know, how mm-hmm. does that impact? And there's the also mystical about the yield curve. You know, when it's inverted, that's a negative signal. It basically tells right. you that the funds rate is high because it's higher than bond yields. So you have all three of those conditions uh, in place. And at the moment, the economy is fine. So the average person says, look, it didn't work. And I say, just wait. You have be to be patient. Um, speaking of transparent, Jerome Powell shows up on 60 Minutes for a long Q&A. First, did, did you get to see him on? Uh, I did. What, what was your thoughts on how he described the economy, um, the state of the world, uh, rates? What, what was your takeaway? He seems like a pretty impressive guy. I agree. He's very easy on the eyes. Right. He's, he's easy to listen to. He, he looks like a central he banker, like a, doesn't he? <laughs> that may be one of the reasons that he got appointed. But. Straight from central casting. I mean, yeah. but but very, very thoughtful and and reassuring in a lot of ways. So the only thing that uh, I disagree with him on mm-hmm. uh, is he presents the case that the economy is doing this now, therefore it means that monetary policy is either tight or loose. Uh-huh. And I said, no, that, that doesn't work that way. You have to wait a year and a half to find out. And that's what makes it so difficult to do monetary policy because what you do today, it's like turning a tanker. Right. And it takes, uh, I don't know, 10 miles or so to turn it. And it takes a year and a half for monetary policy. So and, when and that, was when was the last tightening? Was uh, July, twenty twenty three. So we're still we're still six days. months away from feeling the effect of what they six months, uh, uh, probably longer than that. Yeah. Where where till the end of twenty twenty four, we haven't fully felt the impact of of the last hikes. Correct. And the the yield curve inverted in late twenty two. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're about 14 or 15 months. What's and the average? 18 is... Uh, From inversion to recession. To recession. All right. 18 so months. That's a long time. And, and this, you know, Milton Friedman, uh, I'm saying the obvious, he was very smart. Mm-hmm. And he didn't say there are long lags. He said they're long and variable lags. <laughs> and sometimes I get a little too... Like I mentioned... I think I've, I think I've mentioned eighteen months five times to right. him. Like it's a but he would tell you it's six to thirty six months, yes. not eighteen months. Right, and and so I mean it could last longer than eighteen months, which would take you. And, and then you have the, the the election coming up. Right. Uh, and at this point, there's really nothing the Fed can do to influence the economy. You know, during November of this this year. So someone else recently commented. I'm glad you brought that up. So you have a number of – so we had the CARES Act 1, 2, and 3, and each of them, the first two under Trump, the third one under Biden, each of them just a ton of fiscal stimulus into the economy all at once. A lot of the recent in, um, legislation, so the infrastructure bill, semiconductor bill, the um, inflation reduction bill, all three of these are like 10-year legislations that they have a lot of – um, discretion as to how that gets meted out. Now, you can't dump all of it into, hey, it's an election year, spend the whole thing, because <laughs> they're all much longer-term projects. But I was always under the impression that the White House can goose the economy a little bit if, if they planned ahead the year before and and passed some legislation. Is, is that oversimplifying this? I don't think so. And I would be surprised if there's not some of that going on, a mm-hmm. little thumb on the scale. And the same probably is true for energy prices. You know, if they can, Oh really? Well, if you can, you know, influence, you know, our friends in Saudi Arabia or the Middle East. Right. Uh, you got uh, a war in, between Russia and Ukraine, you got a hot war in the Middle East. It's kind of amazing that oil prices aren't $92. It is, unless you look at the fact that the money supply growth has gone from 30% down mm-hmm. to minus 2. Right. And I'd also say in a practical way, because I find the the money supply story, it gets old after a few months. Mm-hmm. 18 months, people say, forget enough it. Enough already. Yeah, enough already. It's like already. you're going to miss the end. It's like leaving before the ninth <laughs> inning of the game. You don't know what's going to happen. And But I think uh, you know China is a major 
factor in this. And China's economy is still pretty soft. We survey 21 companies that have sales in China. Uh -huh. And that survey this past week was 31. I mentioned wow, way below 45. Way below 45. So that our is survey, deep recession territory. Our, our survey is 49. Right. And it's only been this low, 31, for a few weeks during the pandemic. Really? In, in China. Wow. So that's one measure. Well, let, let, before you move on to the next measure, let's stay with China. This is the second largest economy in the world. It's the in, industrial um, heartland of the global economy. If they're deep in a recession, like I know we used to say the U.S. catches a cold and the whole world gets pneumonia, but has that changed over the past 50 years? If China is deep in a recession, are they dragging the rest of the world down with them, or are they a reflection of a slowing Europe and a soft South America and Africa? One question is, you know, why are they slowing? Mm -hmm. And another question is, what's the implication of them slowing? The first part is more complicated, why they're slowing. But the property market in China apparently is a real mess. And, Giant. And, and going to stay that way for a long time. Uh, decades, right? When you say a long time, this isn't fixed. In, uh, this is like a, a deep structural problem they so, created so Barry, themselves. I'm, I'm 78, so let, <laughs> let's, let's not talk in decades. You know what? Not your lifetime, maybe not my lifetime. I, I, I only have, you know, you only have a decade or so on me. Yeah. I'm not a, I don't know if I'm ever going to see a robust real estate market in my lifetime in China. Yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of long-term forecasting, right. but- uh, Anyway, it's pretty tough in China now. And you know, one of the other things that I do is I talk to clients relentlessly. Mm -hmm. And when I get to talk to somebody who's just back from China, I really grill them. And uh, what I'm hearing now is that the locals in China are not optimistic. They're pretty down in the dumps. Animal spirits are pretty somber, which is not surprising. Right. But I'm just saying, uh, if you talk to people here in the States, you know, things seem to be doing moving in well. the right direction. Can, can she turn around so, and say, all right, here's a, a whole new plan and we're going to, hey, the U.S. just did a giant fiscal stimulus or three. We're going to do one also. So I'm I'm a team player uh, and I, I love working with people. I love working with our clients and I love working with our research team. And our research team, if I may sure. pat them on the back, is the number one team on the street. This is now the second year in a row. We have a really good research team, and we have an uh, an analyst, a research team that covers China, mm -hmm. Neil Wang. He's Chinese. He knows what he's talking about. So far, they haven't done anything dramatic. Say, she has not done something. And I thought by now he would have done something, but he it hasn't. Kind of surprising, right? Surprising. So, so, so let's. China is its own entity. What else do you see in the global economy that's worth? Mentioning Europe, Europe seems to be unable to get out of its own way. Also, Europe's, you know, is, Europe is is weak. So our, we do a survey of twenty eight companies mm -hmm. in Europe, and that survey is thirty five. Also, as uh, almost as soft as China, almost as soft as China, not as, but it's soft, and they have problems, you know, themselves. Mm -hmm. And so you have hindsight is great, <laughs> but uh, always but twenty twenty. But now. You know, sitting here with you, we're trying to look through the fog. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talked about China. It looks like China's second biggest economy in the world is not doing well, not strong. And and then Europe is not strong either. And no one is, there's no particular fiscal stimulus there. Ba Central bank there, the ECB, they're still tight. Not as tight as the Fed, but they're still tight. Inverted yield curve, contraction and Mm -hmm. bank loans and money. So, you know, we might look back at this and say that was simple. The rural right. economy was soft. And of course, inflation came down, which I think is, at the moment, I think inflation coming down has been the most important aspect in the past year uh, for getting the markets to turn around, getting the Fed to pause, talk about rate cuts, increasing the odds of a soft landing because inflation has going, has going away. So, so the last question I'm going to ask you about the state of the economy today or in the near future, what else should we be paying attention to if we want to see the signs that either the U.S. is sliding into a recession or 
accelerating out of it and and is going to avoid a recession? What are the most important signposts investors should be looking at? So I watch our company surveys the most closely. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, your viewers or listeners... (laughs) They don't have that, but that so that's that influences me the most. Mm-hmm. Uh, and right now they're they're okay. They're not great, but you know they're definitely not recession. Secondly, the best government data are the weekly unemployment claims, mm-hmm. and they are strong as garlic. I mean, I get a <laughs> I get a headache. We, we've had them. a short. You know, we have not had enough. It's so funny when we looked at inflation. We didn't have enough chips for cars. We didn't have houses. We underbuilt houses for a decade, and we don't have enough workers. We don't have enough labor. This has very much been a lack of supply uh, driving inflation. And uh, how do you get above three and a half, four percent unemployment if there aren't enough bodies? So you'd have to weaken the economy, but it's. I think you put your finger on it perfectly. We've had an unusual lack of supply. At the same time, we've had an unusual increase in monetary and fiscal stimulus. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is like <laughs> it created a great economy, but also created a real bad inflation problem. And a number of people warned about the inflation. I remember Professor Jeremy Siegel saying, "We've never had this much fiscal stimulus without a huge inflation spike." And people looked at him in like 2021, like he had two heads, and yeah. he turned out to be dead, dead right. right. All right, so enough of the U.S. and global economy. Before I get to my favorite questions, I have to throw a curveball at you. The International Tennis Hall of Fame, what do you do with the International (laughs) Tennis Hall of Fame? So so I love tennis. (laughs) I picked up the game uh, less than 10 years ago and fell in love with it also. It's it's wonderful. I'm a lousy player. I've been playing, I guess, since I was about 20 years Mm -hmm. old. And uh, I know how to play tennis. I've been trying to play golf recently. And I, I can see that I don't know how to play golf, but tennis, and I love tennis. Right. And so years back, a friend of mine was on the board of the Tennis Hall of Fame. And so I got on and I was on there for maybe a decade, uh, but I'm still fascinated by the game. And boy, the players now are unbelievable. just unbelievable. And the depth of the players, like Alcaraz came along and now it looks like he's beatable. Uh, unbelievable, really, really interesting. All right, so let's jump to our favorite questions that we ask all of our guests. Starting with, what's keeping you entertained these days? What What are you streaming or, or watching or listening to? I don't stream at all. <laughs> well, I, not really. You know, I've, I'm a big consumer of uh, business news. Mm-hmm. Anything. You know, I'd be embarrassed to tell you how much time I spend listening to Bloomberg. Right. But it's a it's a real treasure. Well, it's uh, geared towards you and your clients. Yeah, it's not a coincidence that that's the target right. market, institutional investors. So I'm all over that. I read probably a dozen newspapers a day. Mm-hmm. And, and the, the amount of news coming out is just... It's a fire hose. It's a fire hose. And it, frankly, it, it's made my job much, much more difficult because it's so hard to add value. I mean, it's, it's very difficult to add value. And so I'm always intently aware of that that uh, I have to pick and choose what I try and put in front of people uh, because it's just redundant. Is that why you said the 2010s were such a challenging decade running a research shop because of the just massive amounts of well, re- well, news coming out? Well, it's not that really. For that one thing, uh, in 2010, that was the peak of, this, of my business. And the dynamic has been active to passive. Right. Active managers use my work and and use my firm's work. So as that shrinks a little bit, it's going to – that much less demand from that side. It's now 50-50, 50% active, 50% passive. In ETFs and mutual funds, but not overall in the total uh, equity markets. Total equity markets. Really? 50-50. That's a big number. I keep reading much low, like 25 and 30 well, anyway, whatever it is, right? It takes, but you know, it's, it. it's always taking, you know, audience away from and and trading volumes away, mm-hmm. and then the cents per share of trading sure has come down. Giant. So it, it's a much more difficult business than it was. Let's talk about mentors who helped shape your career. It's a good question, Barry, because I think for anybody, a big part of their success depends on 
this working out in a positive way. Mm -hmm. My first job was working for Professor Otto Eckstein, who was Council Economic Advisors, cover of Time Magazine, taught the freshman course at Harvard, a wonderful person, wonderful family person. And um, I was just lucky working for this guy. Usually influential in, in guiding you. And he's also extremely hardworking. I remember he would come back from a trip to Europe and he would have written a whole paper. <laughs> I thought, my God. On vacation. No, on, on business, coming back on a business trip from Europe. Oh, really? He was always working. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, he was just a, a fine person. And I know whatever positive attributes I have, I picked up a lot from him. And then I went to work for C.J. Lawrence, and Jim Moltz uh, ran that firm. He was my boss. And I just scored big a second time. Prince of a person, a great intellect, a very serious investor, a good macro guy, but a real stock person. Mm -hmm. And and he was very helpful to me uh, in culture, ethics, just a, a great role model. And then I worked for myself. That was a pretty low point. <laughs> but that seemed to have worked out. That, that uh, seemed to work, work out okay. Right. Let's talk about books. What are, what are some of your favorites? What have you read recently? There's a book called Trust. Mm-hmm. And it's a, uh, it's a fiction. And I haven't read a fiction, I don't know, in 30 years. Uh, I know and, the feeling. And I, I read it, and it, was, it just was delightful. And I, I learned a lot from it. And uh, it made me think a lot of, it, it's written about the depression and going up to it and after that. And it, it's made me think differently about the depression than I did before. Mm-hmm. And, and now I read uh, my buddy Ed Yordini's trying to make out like we're headed t- to a new Roaring Twenties uh, period. Mm-hmm. But that's a, that's a good read recently. Chip Wars is a must read. Fascinating and, book. F- fascinating book. You know, brings up, you know, or you think about Taiwan and China, Taiwan and China, Taiwan and China, and, and, you know, what could happen there. Henry Kissinger has a book out about leaders. It's, it's actually all the leaders he worked with. Mm-hmm. And it's a very interesting read. But, the, you know, the ones that you know, have been most influential in the long term uh, for anybody in this business are uh, reminiscences of a stock operator. Sure. Uh, by what's it, Jesse Livermore? Right. I mean, you have to read that. Hopefully you read it when you're young. It's amazing how fresh it still is today. You would think it's dated, but it's not. Uh, so those are some of the books I've been trafficking in. But I read, <laughs> one, one thing I found is that people that do well read a lot. No, no doubt about that. Our final two questions, what sort of advice would you give to a recent college grad who is interested in a career in either investing or economic research? The most important advice I can give people is to work hard. Boy, that sounds superficial, but I'm sure that is, you know, everybody you can think about, that's the common denominator. So for a young person, they just have to work hard at finding their voice, finding their path. Uh, I was lucky. I found it easily. Mm-hmm. You know, I can see some young people don't find it easily. So that's, uh, you got to work hard. And first, you got to work hard at finding your path. And then once you find it, then it's easy, frankly. I think you found your path. And it I took me a while, but I eventually got here. You got there. Right? And uh, now in terms of this business being the best business, yeah, you, you know, as well as I do, it's an enormously interesting field. And I get up in the morning, I sort of jump out of bed. And <laughs> right. First thing I do is I <laughs> start reading my Bloomberg to see what happened. That, that's really fabulous. Let, let's jump to our final question. What do you know about the world of investing today that you wish you knew back in 1970 when you were first getting started 50 years ago? You know, this is one I've gotten before. Mm-hmm. And I think about it, nothing comes to mind. I'm sure really? That, yeah, I'm sure there nothing is. Nothing would have helped you out that you know today, gee, if only I knew 50 years ago uh, yeah. that I shouldn't do this. Well, you know, you can do that. You say, you know, you know I should have, you know, got I don't into... mean buy Amazon at the IPO. Right. I mean, <laughs> what, what, what? knowledge do you have now? What wisdom have you acquired? Nothing, hey, that would have been useful. Well, nothing comes to mind. I, maybe I'm just brain dead. No, that's but, fascinating because what you're really saying is it's the it's the road, not the destination. What it's I, what you learned along the way and, and when you learned it. What I'm, I think is a better question now, maybe for me, but maybe for even a young person, is if you go out a decade from now, 
and you want to look back at your life, what do you want to see? That's an open slate. You can make that happen. And, and that's and, a question you can think about at any point in your, your professional your career. And so right. right now, that's what I think about the most. And nothing just jumps out at me. I knew I was going to enjoy doing this with you. Well, I always enjoy chatting with you. It's but, always uh, a delight. Um, so maybe we'll do it in another decade. <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to wait another decade. We'll do it sooner than that. Thanks, Ed, for being so generous with your time. We have been speaking with Ed Hyman. He is the chairman and co-founder of ISI Evacor. If you enjoy this conversation, well, check out any of the 500 we've done over the past 10 years. You can find those at iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Bloomberg, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Be sure and check out my new podcast, At The Money, where I sit down for a quick Q&A for 10 minutes to chat with an expert about issues that affect your money, earning it, spending it, and mostly investing it. Find that uh, wherever you get your favorite podcasts and in the Masters in Business podcast feed. I would be remiss if I did not thank the crack team that helps put these conversations together each week. Sebastian Escobar is my audio engineer. Atika Valbrun is my project manager. Sean Russo is my head of research. Anna Luke is my producer. Sage Bauman is the head of podcasts at Bloomberg. I'm Barry Ritholtz. You've been listening to Masters in Business on Bloomberg Radio. 